All right, good morning. So welcome, first of all, and secondly, as we gather, just a reminder, we do this once a month uh, to open public safety up to some questions that you may have, but also to talk about some of the important things going on. Today's a little bit different, however. We're only going to be talking about one topic because it's of such importance, and we're grateful to have uh, the mayor here and uh, council members as well, along with the chief. I just want to add a few remarks to kind of set the stage. You know, when I arrived here in Denver and was very blessed and fortunate to be selected uh, by the mayor, uh, I arrived and started looking at immediately the use of force policy. Because of the national narrative that's going on across this country, that's something that's important for any director of public safety or police chief to do. What I found, however, was that the police department had a self-initiated review of the policy and that the community had become involved. And I think that's uh, very good for the city, very good for Denver, that you had a police department that actually started this process. So with that, uh, the process continued to work. I know there's ups and downs, as we've all been aware of, but at the end of the day, this is a very progressive and a national leading policy, and I am certainly grateful to be a small part of that. I also want to thank uh, my predecessor, Stephanie, for the work that she did in moving this forward as well. But none of this could have happened without the seven years of leadership of Mayor Hancock. His focus on reform is something that drove this policy to fruition. Uh, he made sure that we listened to the community as a Department of Safety and the Police Department. It's that type of leadership is the reason I want to be in the city, and I believe it's why we have one of the uh, best def our, uh, policies now in the country. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to our Mayor, Mayor Hancock. Thank you, Director Riggs. Let me um, do a couple things. One, I just simply want to thank all the members of the Use of Force uh, Task Force that came together. Um, those who are external to the city, external stakeholders, as well as uh, the Director's Office, the Chief of Police under the leadership and stewardship of uh, former Chief Robert White, and now the leadership and stewardship of Chief uh, Paul Pazin. And I also want to thank certainly the members of the Denver City Council who leaned in. And I mean, this was not just a superficial leaning in. I could tell you, I know from conversations with Councilwoman Kanish and Councilman Paul Lopez, um, that they leaned in hard and gave all the due diligence necessary for this very important and critical policy. I want to thank not only Councilwoman Kanish and Councilman Paul, Paul Lopez, but also Councilman Flynn and Councilman Herndon, who also leaned in on this. But we owe the task force a tremendous debt of gratitude, um, uh, both internal and external to the city, for their tremendous work on this. The second and final thing that I'll say about this is that this is a critical policy for the city of Denver all over the country. There are conversations and efforts in big cities, medium cities, and small cities. And we learned that from Ferguson, where citizens and police departments are having to think about two things. One, how policing is changing and the expectations of the public uh, on how police officers relate to them and how the public relates to the police officers, um, which requires us as leaders to not only think about today, but also in the future how people expect officers to react and to respond even in difficult, challenging situations. And so I am proud of the fact that the task force has now formulated a policy that is progressive, that is innovative, and quite frankly um, meets the, the challenges of a 21st century policing strategy that the public expects um, to have our officers carry forward as stewards and trustees of our community. So I'm proud to be here with Director Riggs and Chief Pazin and members of our city council and the city attorney's office as we, uh, you know, roll out this very important and critical uh, policy for the city of Denver for not only keeping our police officers safe, but also keeping the people of the city safe. So with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Police Chief Paul Pazin. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we'll get started. We'll talk about some of the highlights uh, of the policy as well as outline the process that, that brought us here. Uh, first, we would like to talk about the, uh, the timeline. Uh, I, I would be remiss if we didn't uh, point out some of the very strong policy that has already uh, been initiated, including the shooting at moving vehicles. This was started back in uh, June of 2015, and uh, this uh, strong progressive policy is really a uh, precursor to, to where we are uh, today. Uh, as we continue down, the decision-making model is something that our officers utilize day-to-day -day in uh, ensuring that we are de-escalating situations and we're really uh, thinking through the responses before uh, they actually occur. Uh, this is a, a great way to uh, assist us in our interactions with the, the community that we serve. 
Uh, the initial draft policy uh, started in January of 2019, uh, and that was with a lot of input from senior command staff. Uh, this policy was uh, later opened up to the community. Several meetings were held, as well as uh, some uh, email that was created in an email account that was created to allow uh, feedback from um, our community. Then the, the tough work uh, began, and uh, I really uh, believe that we uh, need to thank uh, this committee that uh, assisted us in this process, and uh, we can show some of the areas where uh, their direct input has assisted us in making this very strong and progressive uh, policy. So uh, ultimately, uh, 19 months, 19 months of heavy lift and hard work uh, took place in order to get us to where we are today. Uh, essentially, this uh, policy now uh, is in the training and implementation phase, and we are going to be working hard uh, towards that goal. We have uh, a very ambitious timeline moving forward because this policy – arguably the most critical policy that any police department can have deserves to the, the training to go with it. If we are going to put this much work into developing a strong progressive policy, we need to put the same amount of effort into training the 1,525 officers in the Denver Police Department. Uh, an overview of the policy, it, uh, it, it, it's really uh, stating, uh, publicly stating our philosophical goals uh, here. It increases in count accountability and uh, to, kudos to Chief White because uh, this is one of his phrases. Uh, just because an officer can use force doesn't mean that an officer should use force. And this is where we are elevating the bar. We are raising the standard uh, far beyond Graham versus Connor and, and what – uh, the courts ha have ruled. We are holding ourselves to uh, a higher account. And uh, really, when we're talking about philosophical goals, it's all about de-escalation in order to increase both uh, police officer safety and our public trust with the community members. Uh, we talked about uh, all of the work that the uh, committee uh, had. I would like to publicly thank uh, the different groups that participated in this heavy lift, uh, the Denver Justice Project, the ACLU. We had the Ministerial Alliance together for Colorado. Wes, I see you over there. Thank you. Uh, Colorado Latino Forum, uh, Denver City Council, uh, specifically uh, the council members that the mayor has spoke of, the city attorney's office. Again, this could not have been done without the hard work from the city attorney's uh, office. Uh, we had many other uh, stakeholders, the Police Officer Foundation as well, uh, the mayor for all of his support uh, during this, as well as the executive director of, of public safety. Uh, we also had input from the labor organizations that represent the, the Denver Police Department, and we want to thank them uh, for that. Planning and Research has done a lot of uh, work in, in this process, uh, as well as our uh, senior command staff. And I'll point out a couple of examples where taking a fresh look at this policy really helped us enhance the final product. Uh, policy comparisons, uh, this is what the Denver policy looks like uh, as compared to other cities across the country. I want to note that uh, these were outside agency policy reviews were conducted in uh, October of 2016, so if they have enhanced their policy since then, uh, this, this is a snapshot in time. The Denver policy as compared to the International Association of Chiefs of Police recommended or consensus policy. We and show uh, here that the, the Denver policy is, is very strong when you are looking at uh, national comparisons. Uh, a centerpiece, uh, as we spoke of earlier, to the use of force policy is making uh, critical decisions. And uh, we have given uh, our officers a decision-making tool. Uh, this, is a this has assisted us in uh, – our efforts to uh, keep our officers safe as well as keep the community safe and really uh, taking the, the time, time and distance to think through uh, processes and making critical decisions is something that has proven very valuable, particularly as we stated with the, the shooting at moving vehicles. 
I would like to point out a, a couple of examples uh, here where the committee uh, in working with the police department has really uh, helped us enhance uh, this policy. Uh, as you can see, over 100 committee recommendations have uh, gone into this policy. That's quite significant, and I'll give an example of that. Uh, as you can see uh, right at the beginning, the purpose of this policy, uh, the white text is committee uh, language and the gray edits are DPD uh, edits. So uh, this is a, the, the prime example of committee's language being incorporated with DPD uh, language to create uh, some common ground and ultimately have a stronger policy as a result of that. Uh, we did have some uh, areas where uh, we needed to uh, agree uh, on our uh, overall uh, declaratory uh, statement here and reasonable and necessary is, is where uh, both the committee and the department uh, came together. Uh, this is a, a good example of how the committee uh, saw things as well as the police department and finding common ground and, and we're going to say that a couple of times here. Next is, uh, this, this was a big point of contention, and I am uh, very thankful for committee members for bringing this uh, to our uh, attention. Uh, this was, uh, again, something that uh, having our uh, team work together with the committee in, in the final hours uh, of the uh, policy review and coming up with areas where we could really uh, work together. This is the, the prime example uh, of that. Uh, this is an area where where our officers uh, clearly know what the policy is when we're talking about the amount of force uh, necessary versus the type of force. And uh, kudos to the, uh, the committee and our team for taking a second look at this and uh, ultimately coming up with a, uh, a better product in the end. Uh, we, because we were able to, to, to take a second look uh, at this, uh, we put some fresh set of eyes on the entire process. And here's a, an area where I would like to uh, applaud uh, our team, our senior uh, command staff here. Uh, this is a direct benefit of having two former commanders that led uh, internal affairs as well as two former commanders of the major crimes division. Uh, those areas intersect with uh, this policy quite a bit and uh, getting their input to this ultimately comes up with a stronger policy and I want to specifically call those out. So this is an area with uh, rip restraints that we are again uh, holding ourselves to a higher standard. Uh, there are some uh, positional uh, asphyxiation issues that could be uh, utilized in this and we are clearly defining that those are not allowed under the, the new uh, policy and uh, we are solidifying those in the, the new policy as it moves forward, as well as uh, some of the highest levels of use of force that could uh, be utilized, clearly articulating in the, the policy uh, when a body-worn camera can be viewed and when it cannot. So uh, this was uh, an area where our staff, uh, you know, again, identified an area where we can improve. Uh, we didn't try to trade back and forth with the committee. We just saw it as the right thing to do, and so we implemented that. I know I blasted through this 27-page uh, uh, document, five different uh, sections in uh, rapid-fire succession, but really what we wanted to highlight and focus on is thanking the committee for all of their uh, work, but really uh, this is what uh, we want to point to, the, the training uh, aspect of it. In order to honor this 19 months' worth of work in uh, critical decision-making critical policy, it is important that we put forth that same type of effort in training uh, all of our officers, and we, uh, we believe we have a very comprehensive training program uh, moving forward. So uh, 2018, uh, starting the week of August uh, 20th, uh, our team, uh, led by a command officer and a supervisor that represents both the Training Bureau and Internal Affairs, uh, a cadre of instructors will start in District 6. We have a plan uh, that doesn't interrupt uh, 
uh, calls for service on the street. But we have a very – let me let me go backwards for a second. It's a very ambitious uh, plan because we want to get this policy uh, out and trained as soon as uh, possible. So it's starting in uh, District 6. It's going to be uh, eight-hour uh, training on the policy. This includes uh, lectures-based uh, as well as uh, slides and videos, discussion-based uh, with our officers to, to really get an understanding of uh, this new uh, policy. Uh, as you can see, we are delineating that the supervisors will get an additional four hours worth of, of training uh, on this. We need to make sure that the sergeants that are doing those initial on-scene uh, investigations uh, clearly know and understand their role and how important the investigation and the documentation on scene uh, is. So we uh, are, are separating or adding the additional four hours for the, the supervisors. Uh, again, this is a phased approach, uh, each district and division with uh, that very ambitious target of getting uh, the tr training uh, concluded by the end of the year, start of uh, next year. Moving forward in 2019, uh, this is uh, an area that we are really excited uh, about because I think that this is going to assist uh, not only uh, the officers and their level of understanding, but again, uh, the entire city and more importantly, the community that we serve. So uh, we are in uh, partnership with the Police Foundation working towards uh, purchasing an additional module for that Virtua 300 training simulator that we have. Uh, Virtua reality is what the, the Virtua stands for. And we will create our own uh, videos, our own sim simulations of prior use of force incidences uh, in order to completely train out the, the gray areas to make sure that our officers know exactly what is expected of them uh, with this very strong, comprehensive, and progressive um, policy. So we're really excited about that. It's going to take us uh, a few months to get uh, these types of scenarios built, but essentially we're going to build on that foundation, the eight-hour foundation of 2019, and it's going to be ongoing training on critical policies uh, ultimately helping uh, our officers with a deeper understanding of uh, this policy. And essentially that's it. We can take some uh, questions now. We do have some members of the committee if you want to – I don't want to – actually I probably should have checked in before we said that, right, Wes? Um, I'm sorry, the council members uh, as well. Uh, that way you can get their perspective uh, of this heavy lift that took place, the 19 months worth of, of, of work. So you can grab them uh, after the meeting if that's okay. That's not a question, is it, Noel? That's just a hands up. <laughs> Chief, Chief, what do you look at as one of the most impactful changes um, that would, if you're a typical officer on the street, What's going to be one of these policies that you think will actually make a difference in the, in the lives of the community of Denver? Uh, it, it goes right back to that uh, philosophical approach, right? When we're emphasizing de-escalation, I think uh, that is the, the perfect example. Uh, we want to make sure that our, our officers are making uh, decisions uh, consistent with our values, utilizing that decision-making model with that strong emphasis on de-escalation. of events that we saw on national media? Was it anything locally that you, you, you felt that really the city of Denver needed, needed to start this policy so many years ago? Yeah, all those things. I mean, and that's the, the actual, absolute truth that, you know, you watch not only the, the uh, uh, transforming uh, moments across the nation, but also here. And you might recall um, when I was running for mayor in 2010, right, you know, 2011, that um, we had some pretty high-profile incidents that were on video, which made me and others really contemplate it, it was time to move the department in a different direction. And then on top of that, you start having national um, um, stories that have evolved. And so this conversation is taking place. But I also want to just remind you that over the last five or six years, uh, under you know Chief White, Director O'Malley, 
Chief uh, Director Riggs and, and, and certainly at the time Commander, but now Chief Pazin, spent a lot of time having conversations in the community beyond before the task force was even formed. And this use of force, uh, concerns around use of force, a lot of these incidents were top of mind of pe for people. And we've got to find a way to create that balance where um, citizens and police officers are valuing life and getting through these very tough, dangerous, potentially dangerous situations so that everyone will get where they need to be and ultimately we can have justice carried out, but not in those moments. So um, these have been critical conversations that have helped Denver evolve and begin really taking the lead of uh, implementing this type of very progressive, innovative policy. All right, well. All right, well, thank you for being here.